Morning right. Press go live, Joe. Oh, oh. Hello. I didn't know there was going to be an intro. I was <laughs> trying to tell Welcome you that. To the Albion Obsessed podcast. You join us live on this uh, edition today. We've already had a bit of a heated discussion backstage, so it's going to be really interesting to see uh, the views today because, um, yeah, it's been a bit of a day, hasn't it? Some controversial decisions in the game against Chelsea today. But before we dive into any of that malarkey, let's see who we've got on the show. We welcome Joe. Joe, my friend, how are you? The start of this show is a little bit like our performance. Um, <laughs> yeah, just uh, communication lacking, I guess. But yeah, no, I'm all right. I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm ready to, to back Dagan up because I think Dagan was about to back me up without hearing what I was going to say. But anyway, yeah, let, let's let's go. I am I'm good. Well. Let's get on with it. I, I'm fine. No introduction. Yeah. Let's do this. <laughs> we, we do well. I'm, I'm happy to see Glenn, though. I'm really happy to see Glenn. It's good to be here. About Glenn. Glenn, thank you for joining us for the show. Another stateside seagull. Glad to have you here. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you. I appreciate being on. <laughs> fantastic. It's fantastic to have you, Glenn. Let's, uh, let's dive straight into it then, Dagan, because I know you're eager to continue the conversation we were just having. And he's even limbering up, limbering up. It's uh, going to be an interesting one. But before we do that, can we just quickly, really quickly talk um, about the starting 11? I know that you all want to talk about the controversial moments, and I get that. That's, you know, why we're all here, let's be honest. But I, I did just want to talk about the starting 11 because it is worth mentioning, mentioning sorry, uh, five changes from the sides that beat Bayak Athens, in comes Steel, which was a... A bit of a surprise for me, considering how well uh, the Bruggen played against Athens and has generally been playing. Um, um, in comes Lalana as well, Baleba, Buonanote and Van Hecker. Uh, out go Pedro, Matoma and Gross, all who, of whom looked absolutely exhausted um, in the week against Athens. And of course, Dunk, who was suspended. Uh, Joe, um, were you surprised uh, mainly um, with the goalkeeper decision? Uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that latter part of the question because I thought you were going to ask me, were you surprised at the starting 11? And no, because they're probably the only players that we have available to start. Um, the goalkeeping decision, yeah, I was. Um, I think Bart Verbruggen has played exceptionally well in the last two games, um, putting a man on the match performance against Athens. Um, maybe you could say, oh, it's only because it was three days at uh, ago <clears throat> but I, I feel like there's something different with goalkeepers in terms of obviously they don't have to do as much physically um you probably could argue that in, in the deserve side that they are used a little bit more physically but um for me it, it would be a case that Bart Verbruggen stays um and keeps that consistency going um and that consistency at the back that we're so lacking at the moment so um it was a little bit of a strange decision yeah, it's um, it caused quite a stir on uh, X and social media. But then again, every single starting eleven causes a stir. But Dagan, I think it's a, a strong side, as strong as we could hope for, considering the in injuries and other uh, reasons like the Hood and Dunk not being available due to suspension. Um, any surprises in there for you? Jack Kinchelwood retaining his uh, place was uh, nice to see um, after a good performance, but otherwise, as much as we could expect. Yeah, I think I said the other day I thought we'd see Baleba. Um, and we did. Uh, I, I was sad to see him go off when he was off. Uh, and I think it, it, it showed. We'll talk more about that later. Um, you know, Silver Bruggen, I think I said to you guys as well, I didn't think, you know, we were going to move to one guy keeps the job forever. And clearly we haven't. Steele made a lot of good saves. He made, you know, I don't I don't think today is on him in any way. So it's hard to be, but so upset. Um so yeah, I don't I don't have any real complaints about about the starting lineup. It was clear, you know, Gross was on his felt like on his last leg. He didn't show us anything different when he was out there today that he had, you know, was rejuvenated. Um, you know, I, I thought Matoma looked okay. Uh, you know, when he did finally come on. Um, and Jao Pedro, I think was okay. I think he just took a knock and we're trying to be cautious and keep everybody healthy because you know, now the Brentford game looks really, really big. And uh I think probably we were we were taking that into consideration. Um you know, looking at looking at our starting eleven and their starting eleven, 
uh, they had the better starting 11. We probably had the better bench, uh, but Cole Palmer was on, was on the bench for them. That I feel like that gave us a, a little bit of a leg up because he really, he really did a lot. I think in the second half uh, when he did come on, I think he's their best players. You've heard me say before. Um, but yeah, I thought they had, I thought they had a much stronger first 11 than we did. Yeah, I'd be inclined to agree with you. Um, of course, uh, they had James out and Kukurea out as well, serving suspensions, I believe. Yeah, big surprise not to see Cole Palmer uh, start against them, although that was quite relieving at the start of the game. Um, Glenn, were yeah, there any surprises? Sorry, say that again, Dagan. Uh, uh, my buddy Chelsea fan said he had a knock in training this week. Oh, OK. Fair dues. Glenn, any surprises you for the for the starting eleven just before we dive into our match analysis? Surprising necessarily. Um, I well, the big surprise is what you folks have already talked about, which is um, steel. Although some people might say it wasn't a huge surprise, I guess because you, like Dagan's saying, he, he doesn't seem to want to land on one guy for whatever reason. We're not him, so we don't know what. Uh, deserve his thinking, but we watched him play in Athens and saw how good he was. Um, and he's, he's proven himself again and again. So at some point, at some point he's going to go with Verbruggen, you know, it's coming. We just don't know. We just don't know when, and like Dagan said, I love to see Baleva. I, I wish that he was out there all the time. Frankly, uh, I love his physicality and he's young and he's learning. And, and I remember, Gilmore said last year, he said, you, you know, you can be in training and you can learn a whole bunch of stuff, but you actually have to be on the field. Um, and I think that's almost the best way to put is just to get him up to speed is just stick him out there and, you know, sink or swim with him. So. Yeah, fully agree. You, you know, the best, uh, the best teacher is experience. Um, so yeah, hundred percent there. Um, of course, guys, we are live. So if you are joining us live, please drop some comments as we progress. I'm sure there'll be Lots of uh, interesting talking points. Um, I'm not going to lie. Normally, I'm quite good at writing notes um, throughout a game. Um, but today, today, I found it quite difficult. I'm not going to lie. Um, the first note I actually made, uh, I deleted. It was about uh, a tackle Sanchez made on a dingra. It was like a coming together. And I was like, well, that's 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 not OK, Mr. Robert Sanchez. Um, but then I deleted it because... Um, we we went behind and I was so angry in the manner in which we conceded a goal, um, perhaps since escaped me. So, Joe, let's talk about um, the first of which was what was pretty much a nightmarish uh, four or five minutes for Brighton. Um, the game had been pretty, you know, even up until that point. Um, but Chelsea uh, get themselves a corner. Um, the the ball is floated in. Marking is practically non-existent as it floats into the back post. It's played back across goal and an unmarked uh, Enzo Fernandez uh, heads in uh, to the net. Um, a really, 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 really frustrating goal uh, to concede, Joe. Are we not surprised? Set piece. No one marking. Nick Stanley, what does he even do? <laughs> like There doesn't seem to be much of an improvement from set pieces. I think we saw maybe slightly, obviously against Athens, that's where they really hurt us at home. Um, and we we didn't seem to have too many issues, obviously kept a clean sheet against them. So there, there's some improvements slightly, you could say, but it's the consistency that set pieces that when teams find out how they can hurt us from a set piece, they, they will do it time and time again. And it's exactly what you saw in those f five minutes that happens. Fernandez back post bang that happens. Colwell back post bang. And then we're two nil down and scrambling, trying to find a way back into a, a game. That's already a really hard game to win. Um, I, I don't get how you leave because Colwell was unmarked as well. Not, not for his goal, but for Fernandez's goal. Colwell was unmarked. He was stood in front of Enzo Fernandez, almost marking, forgetting that he was a Chelsea player and back on loan at Brighton, picking up the man. So that that's just really frustrating, really stupid, basic stuff that is leading to us going behind in in games. You know, we've seen it so many times this season. And how how do we cut it out? I don't know. I'm not a tactician. I can't sit here and give us a solution. All I know is that it's just unbelievably frustrating. 
um, because looking at it, you you just think that you you know that they can do better, and that's why it's really annoying. Someone pointed out on Twitter, and again, I'm happy to be corrected on this, that uh, it was the same uh, defensive pairing, Igor and uh, Van Hecker, who were in uh, the back four against Athens in the home leg, in which we conceded twice from set pieces. Um, so perhaps we are a bit overly reliant on Lewis Dunk's presence. Um, Dagan and I myself thought if uh, Dunk was playing today, perhaps that first goal doesn't happen. What are your views on that? No, I mean, I thought we sorely missed Dunk throughout. Um, not not that his composure was uh, a strength the last time we saw him. Uh, well, last time we saw him in a Premier League game. Uh, but I, I mean, I thought at many points we we looked just like we lacked the composure needed for the moment. Um, the that first goal, like right, they sent the cross across the face of goal to the other side, and it was a bicycle kick assist, right back in. Like my benefit of the doubt is guys sort of shifted and thought like, okay, the corner is is over and we're good. Like, I, I don't know. Again, a mental lapse um, because those guys weren't unmarked when they were on the near post to start it. They ended up unmarked like after the ball went on the other side. So I, my thought is like, okay, guys are shifting and they, you know, it's not like our personnel is incredibly familiar with each other. It's hard to pick any lineup combination that has spent a ton of time together on the pitch. So the nonverbal communication that I'm sure has to happen for guys to expect like, oh, he's going to take this guy and he's going to take that guy in the chaos that is in a way, in a way environment, like mistakes are going to happen. You give up a bunch of corners to a team that, you know, is hungry. Goals are going to happen. So yeah, we missed dunk. And yeah, I, I watched that corner. It was chaos. It was just a chaotic goal. Like I didn't look at it as a failure as much as I looked at it as the kind of thing when chaos happens some of those goals go in. Sometimes you score them, sometimes you don't. But it, that that to me didn't speak of like blown set piece assignment. Guy went up for a header uncontested and headed it in clean. Um, the second goal I thought was was a poor performance in the first in that regard. But Would you not say, Dagan, that they were almost carbon copies though? Because it was pretty much the exact same play. Ball comes across goal, headed back across to an unmarked player. So surely... The same thing happening twice within four minutes. That's not a freak of nature. That's something to do with our setup. Yeah, I guess. I guess. Um, yeah. The, the first one just struck me. It's surprising because it was a bicycle pass backwards. Like that just feels harder to anticipate than was it a head to a head? I can't think of what the got the ball. One. Yeah, what got the ball to Colwell? I can't. Yeah, that was um, a header. Yeah, header back across goal, Colwell. Yeah. yeah. So, like to me, that's a more traditional. Like that happens. I don't know the bicycle. I can see how people lost sight of the ball, couldn't quite see what was happening. Just that's just not what you expect to happen. So I, I give a little bit of a pass there. It's disappointing, right? In the two goals in four minutes, um, which is typical, right? We have a low stretch and the game completely changes complexion. Um, there are a few moments in this game we can point back to and we will. All right, I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's there's certainly a couple. Glenn, um, just to, you know, it, as I say, the, the first goal felt quite frustrating, but then to, as I've already said, you know, to concede almost a carbon copy mere minutes later, um, really, really frustrating because, I mean, to start with, it was a bit, you know, did it go in, did it, did it not? And um, obviously the, the referee got a buzz on the old uh, on the old watch to say that it had crossed the line, um, but two very frustrating goals to concede within minutes from Brighton, and it just yeah, it just almost like all those game plans that you talk about, it's almost out almost out the window um, within twenty minutes. Yeah, yeah, that's it's that early it's the early part of the game, and it's we've talked about this um, a lot. I was talking about it with Dagan just uh, texting last night. It, it just seems to slip away from us. And all of a sudden, I, I don't know what it is that there's that, you know, it was four minutes. There's that, that lapse where all of a sudden, I don't know what it is. It just, it's, it's frustrating to watch that happen 
so quickly. I mean, I, I, I 100% agree with Dagan when he says, when uh, Dagan, you were talking about that, that first goal, it was such, it was kind of like a fluky sort of goal. I think Hinchelwood was behind him. Um, and then Gilmore was right there. And it was almost like, if it was me, I, I would be thinking, there's no way that ball's going where it went over. He's not going to, and it happened. Um, and so, but, but then, you know, that the, the, the other part of it is then four, you know, four minutes later, you can't, you just can't let that stuff happen. I don't know if Dunk, if Dunk like makes it better. Um, I don't know if he's putting, you know, if he'd be putting people in the right position or, or, or what, but it is frustrating to see Colwell back there free. And, and, and then, you know, just from my perspective, I'm watching it and I thought, well, um, you know, that's out of there. It's not in. And then, you know, then they have to go and look and everything. And it's like, oh my goodness, I just can't, you don't want Colwell to score that. And to his credit, he got excited for a little bit and then he, you know, stopped. And I appreciate that about him. Um, he got mad later, which irritated me, but at least I appreciate that about him. Yeah. I, I can kind of see, you know, I think that initial sort of, yeah, I've scored. And then it was coming. A lot of people saying on Twitter about, oh, yeah, we respect that, Joe. A lot more than uh, people give Dan Byrne credit for. And I got I got quite defensive of my sweet prince, uh, young Daniel Byrne, who, of course, scored against us at the tail end of last season when his boyhood club pretty much, what, clinched Champions League football? I mean, I don't begrudge Dan Byrne, but uh, Joe the sort of semi celebration there from Colwell, a bit of respect, bit of class, or you know, eh, or do you not care anymore? Saving face, don't care, move on. Okay, then I will. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this evening, guys. Uh, thank you, Andrew, for your comments. As I'm watching this game live in the stand, I'm seeing three goals. We let ourselves down, conceding too many goals. Now, Dagan, when I chatted to Sony about this, uh, um, after the Forest game, I, I put down our conceding so many goals down to three things for me. Um, and I know, Dagan, as a, an astute observer of the game, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. Um, so I put down for three things, which I'll sort of like um, condense so I don't waffle on anymore. Um, one, ball retention, giving the ball all away far too easily. Two, uh, not having a central defensive midfielder like Kaiseida or in that sort of mould that stops situations developing before they develop. And then three, as you sort of already alluded to, the rotation of the back five, so back four and the goalkeeper, meaning a lack of, um, you know, that sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? Is that je ne sais quoi? You know, that sort of, as you say, uh, uh, untold communication um, that defenders often need to have so they know where players are going to be without knowing uh, necessarily where they're going to be. What, what do you put it down to? Because that's what, 20 games now that Brighton haven't kept a clean sheet in the Premier League. And that's a pretty worrying statistic. I mean, I, it's not a mystery that Deserby ball is going to concede goals. I'll, I'll come back to the fact that, you know, we've kept a clean sheet in the Europa League for now three and a half games. So we're not incapable of doing it. Uh, the Premier League is a, is a different level. Um, and you're going to get punished for even the smallest mistakes. Um, I'll volunteer again. Chelsea had at least three guys, Mudrick, Caicedo, and Enzo, whose individual cost was greater than that of the entire 11 that we put on the pitch. Um, given the number of injuries we have, like the, we're not going to be perfect. And, and the, the wins that we've garnered lately uh, have been out of scrappiness. Um, so, like, we're going to concede goals. The The goal today, uh, I don't know if I'm, I'm leaping too far ahead, but the goal, the third goal today was far more frustrating than the first two for a number of reasons. Um, but the first two, I, yeah, I mean, I look at as the types of things that happen when you're playing the Premier League against the best teams in the world. And, and Chelsea, as rough as they've been from a what are they capable of standard in any given moment, they are one of the best clubs in the world with some of the most talented players in the world. They haven't put that together over the course of the season, but they played city toe to toe, right? Scored four goals against city. So they scored fewer goals against us today. Than they did against city. Um, like teams are going to score goals from premier league. I think we need to get over it. If we're expecting a clean sheet, 
um, when when we're expecting to be at the top. If we're playing against the bottom teams, yes, it's concerning that we we concede as much as we do. But as long as we outscore them, who cares? I, I if we win every game three to two, I'm a happy person. I don't I don't care. If we win, I mean, I predicted four to three today, right? I expected kind of what we saw: chaos, you know, bodies all over the place, intensity. Um, we just fell a little short in the conversion department. Yeah, we did. And we'll we'll move on to the, those pieces in a minute. Uh, thank you for joining us, guys. Lots of things to comment here. Phil, set pieces are a part of the game that we don't appear to have improved either defending or creating goal chances. It's a shame when other aspects of our game are positive. It negates all the hard work. Of course, we did score from a set piece today, which was a rarity. But we'll, we'll talk more about that uh, a bit later. Welcome, Alfie. Welcome, Stephen. Yes, Jack Hinchelwood played very well today. Um, of all the people in the back four, I'd probably say he he seemed at times to be the most uh, well composed. And I think if it hadn't been for a yellow card, I think he would have stayed on. And who knows, maybe Hinchel would, would being on the pitch instead of Milner in the second half, things might have been different. Um, Dan, my attitude towards the game was whatever will be, will be. We have too many players out to expect anything. Uh, Glenn, when were you when you know going into this game? Um, given our own sort of context of injuries and suspensions and whatnot, were you were you hopeful that we could achieve something? Because in in our Albin Obsessed group chat, before a ball was even kicked, I was sort of really positive in the sense that I was saying it depends on what Chelsea team turns up because Chelsea have been, you know, pretty poor this season. Uh, certainly not up to their you know where they would like to be. Um, so I was very much in the camp of if we can keep and stay in the game, we can get something out of this. I know it's, you know, looking after the fact, but, you know, if you can take yourself back to several hours ago, how did you feel before a ball was kicked? Were you hopeful that against a up and down Chelsea side, we could do OK? Yeah, I expected I expected a tie. That's what I that's I was uh, talking to some folks and um, I mean, 2-2. Two, two, that would have been – that was what I expected. I expected goals. Uh, and, you know, of course, you hope that we can win. Uh, I think that you would even – if we won, I think that you could say that, you know, we, we pulled it out there, uh, meaning it's just we, – we may not have deserved it necessarily, but I was – I expected a tie. I expected a point, and I would have been very pleased to have uh, come away from that um, – yeah, I, I agree. One, I, I agree. At the same time, um, you know, it it would have been. Yeah, yeah. I'll just leave it at that. I, I I would have been. I would have been happy with a point because that would have continued to progress us. You know, I know we wouldn't have moved up the table, and we are. I think we're still eighth, right? Right now, I think we are. So, um, you know, I would have been happy with a draw. To, to be honest, I think I would have been as well. Um, but you know, don't tell, don't tell Chelsea fans that um, because there'll be small club mentality. Um, welcome, Luke. Thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome, Sony. I see you. Um, so yeah, thanks, guys. Keep the comments uh, coming, rolling in, um, because as we get onto the juicy bits, um, it'll be really interesting to see what you've all got to say. Um, let's talk about Facundo Buenanote, shall we? Because um, I think in the first half, I think throughout most of the game, we were pretty lackluster going forward. Um, but as soon as we started to move the ball quite quickly uh, towards the tail end of the second half, um, we did get a, a well, you know, a fan it was a fantastic goal. A Dingra um, across the pitch, a lovely little, I think it was a flick from Lalana, And then Bonanote cuts in on his left foot and pinpoints it past uh, Robert Sanchez and the Chelsea goal. Now, Joe, you know, we've long since said that Facundo Buenanote is not a winger. I still don't think he's got the pace to take on defenders, but it was really nice to see him, you know, putting in a lot of effort uh, today and scoring what was a really nice goal. Do you know what? I've been Facundo Buenanote's harshest critic when he's played, uh, especially at the tail end of last season um, and sort of towards the start of this season. Um, I think a lot of it comes down to obviously him playing on the wing. He's very young, and when he's told something that he doesn't want to do, he doesn't do it. But what I want to do, give him credit for is the fact that he stayed around. He could have easily gone out on loan. The attitude of the player is top, top notch, absolutely fantastic. And 
today is his reward for for cracking on, getting his head down, working hard, and being part of a team. And, and you know, he's called upon to to really step up today, massively, and he will be called upon to step up on Wednesday and uh, Saturday. So I hope this gives him a big boost of confidence that Deserby's putting him in that position for a reason. Deserby knows what a quality player he is. Um, so he he just has to believe that himself. And with that goal, the technique of, of that finish was, you know, a, astute Premier League player. He, he's got it in him. Um, so we just need to see it more consistently. Um, and I think it will come. You know, we, we really do have to remember he's so young. Um, so, yeah, let's let's hope that there's a real good player in there that can perform consistently for us and, and be a really good option. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Dagan, we've said it in the past, you know, Roberto De Zerbi loves a left-footed uh, right winger or right-sided midfielder. It's while we were looking at Cole Palmer in the summer. Um, and Facundo, you know, me and you both, we've said that he's not a winger, he's a number 10. Um, but today he showed glimpses of the kind of player he can be. There were some moments, of course, where he was a bit, um, I don't want to say weak, um, but went down a little bit too easily. But generally, he had a, a, a positive impact on the game, not just from a goal scoring perspective. Yeah, I mean, the, the coach in me imagines the Zerbi looking at him and saying at that goal, that's what I know you have in you. Right. Like, that's why I'm putting you over there, because uh, it, it always seems to me that his body language says he's not happy to be on that right wing. Um, it doesn't feel like he's a winger because, you know, he's not pacey. Um, he's not going to blow by anybody there. But his, you know, there there are shades of, you know, someone like Saka with his feints and fakes. And, you know, he's he is quick. He's not fast, but he is quick. Um, and he created a little space and he took his chance today, which I think we've been waiting to see from him. Because often he's just passive over there. He just plays the ball back, plays the ball back, plays the ball back. Um, and even if he does throw a, throw a cross through, it's not especially purposeful um and and you know today was a was a clean strike everybody in the room i was watching with a number of people and sort of whoa man like it it was it was it wasn't quite McAllister's goal today uh but it was it was a highlight there were gosh there were some highlights around the premier league today uh with some fancy goals um but no i i'm thrilled for him i'm a, you know you know i'm a believer in in bonanate and uh i i like him centrally but you know, does see something and he knows what he's looking at more than I do. So uh, happy to see that come through. And I really thought that was going to turn this whole thing around. I really did. And in that moment, I absolutely thought like, okay, here we go. Yeah. It's um, I mean, he's got, as Alfie's just put in the, uh, in the comments, he's got that agility and that flair, Glenn. And you can't talk about Facundo Buonanotte without mentioning the fact that when he was over in his native Argentina, uh, Carlos Tevez said he was the most, uh, natural had the the best natural ability he had seen in a player since a certain other Argentinian number 10. Um so you know he's still only a young lad he's got a bright future ahead of him. Where do you see uh Facundo Buonanotte going forward Glenn? Is he gonna still be playing out on that right hand side because we need a left footed right sided attacker or do you prefer him in that number 10 role just behind a striker? Well at first I I wanted him in the middle but if he plays like he played today and he continues to get better and we need somebody there, then why not? You know, it's the same thing with Hinchelwood. It's the same thing with Baleba. It's the same thing with, with Van Heck. Remember last year, everyone thought, Oh my goodness, this guy is, he's, he's clumsy. He's, you know, you, you don't trust him. And I remember thinking, boy, this, whoa, this is going to be rough, but look at the person he's become now. And, and again, it's, I love the fact that Deserby sees things in these guys that we don't see. And, and I've had the conversation, you know, and Dagan has said it a hundred times. If he said it once, it's in Deserby, we trust. Deserby sees something he knows. Um, I, I love to see a guy like that succeed uh, in a place where you don't think he will like Hinchelwood. That's another perfect example. How in the world does he get put on the left side? And he's, and he was as surprised as ever as we were to be put back there. Um, so to have uh, Buenonate out there and to see him, you know, gain momentum, that, that goal is going to, 
you know, leaps and bounds, it'll, it'll make him a stronger person. If he keeps, if he keeps leaving him out there on the right, um, you know, I, he's going to have to, I mean, you know, I don't know what's going on with Matoma. Um, you know, he, he may just have to, and, and, and Facunda's just going to have to grow up over there. And I think he did a good job. He, he took a, a big step forward today. Yeah, there's always something that that sign there, hasn't there, about promise. And, you know, he's got that ability. I think it was when we played Manchester City uh, last season. He looked like one of the best players on the pitch. And he's been, just been so up and down. Um, but as you say, Glenn, um, you know, we've had to throw players in because it's been a needs must. It's as Sony says, it's volcano time, baby. Um, so, you know, everyone just needs to sort of to pull together. I see in the comments here, Alfie talking about uh, Sarmiento, who scored an absolute beauty uh for West Brom the other day absolute screamer um would be fantastic to have uh, him back at the club but obviously um we can't because of uh you know we've got no recall options uh Abdul Asima, he's uh, been playing well for Rangers it is worth mentioning that you know Rangers play in a farmers league but you know that's that's by the by uh Kozlowski as well out on loan in uh I think he's out on loan in the Netherlands uh, and he's playing quite well over there as well. So we've got a lot of promising players, um, but they're just not um, with us at this uh, uh, moment. Um, Joe, it, it looked like it, things were going to, you know, the turnaround, brilliant time to score from us. Um, but Chelsea almost uh, restored their two goal lead pretty much instantaneously. And they would have done if it hadn't been for a big stop uh, from Jason Steele. Um, they always say that you're most uh, vulnerable after you've just scored, and we looked immediately uh, vulnerable. Yeah, um, we lord Deserby's team, Deserby as mentality monster, mentality king, whatever we've said before. Um, I, I don't know if it's fatigue, mental fatigue from playing so many games, but that mentality does seem to be slightly off at times. Um especially as you say when you you find your way back into a game that when you go 2-0 down really quickly you think that's a hell of a mountain to climb you get your foot in the door and then you can't take your foot off the gas um and that's exactly what we did and we were lucky that you know Jason Steele was there to make a a, a big save and um you know I wish that that big save meant more for the rest of the game um, because it, it was a, a really, really good save. Um, one of those moments that should change a match, but, you know, in the end, didn't really. No, and I think you, you've pointed out something, Joe, about there, about fatigue. And I think, I think it's worth remembering that when you look at the squad that we started with today, it's predominantly made up with very young players. You've got Steele, Veltman and Lalana as your, your senior players. You've got Igor, who's mid-20s, which is still relatively young uh, from a footballing perspective. And a lot of young lads, Evan Ferguson, still a teenager. Facundo Buonanotte, still a teenager. Adingra, still very young. Hinchelwood, you know, very young player. So these guys are going to have um, maybe not as much physical fatigue as the likes of Pascal Gross, but they've probably got the emotional and the, the mental fatigue that someone like Adam Lalana, who's 35, who was leading the press at times today, perhaps doesn't have as much of, because he's got that experience of playing in Europe and playing very regularly. Um, whereas perhaps people like Evan Ferguson just don't yet. Um, so it is worth mentioning that if when we talk about fatigue, it's not just the physical fatigue that we know many of our players are, are feeling. Pascal Gross and Matoma um, spring to mind. It's the mental and the emotional one as well, because you know, Thursday must have been an emotional night. You know, it, it, it would have been. So um, to play again on Sunday is going to be quite a difficult um, challenge for those young players. Um, <clears throat> Dagan, uh, the half uh, drew uh, to an end um, with a second yellow card uh, for Conor Gallagher, who hacked down, um, who was it? Was it Billy Gilmore? He hacked down. Um, um, and then he looks at the referee as if to say, what are you talking about? I've done nothing wrong. And then after the game, Pochettino was saying, I don't know why he's got a second yellow card. Um, do you think this is like just managerial posturing because they don't want to admit that their players done something wrong? Or do they perhaps need a trip to their local glasses shop? Uh, I was I was screaming in the moment uh, of the initial you know, view. Um, it wasn't as 
bad as it looked at first glance, but it was still obviously a yellow card worthy foul. Uh, any claim opposite that is blindness or posturing as you, as you stated. Um, yeah, I think that's just sticking up for your guy and, and deflecting from having to deal with the other issue, which is that Caicedo should have been off as well. Um, so just draw a question to everything. Uh, some of it's bound to stick. Seems like the, the right tactic there. Um, yeah, just insufferable. Like to suggest that that wasn't obvious is yeah, just, yeah, asinine. Very, very annoying. And, um, well, it all seemed to be going quite swimmingly then, really. We just scored as the half ended. We were going to play 45 minutes against 10 men. We still had Matoma, Gross, um, and Jao Pedro on the bench. So what could possibly go wrong? Glenn, um, before we start our second half analysis, were you surprised um, that those, some of those changes weren't made at the half? Um, I was particularly surprised that perhaps, although he was probably one of, once again, one of our better players, I was a bit surprised that Adam Lalana didn't come off, but more so because I think Adam Lalana's body just it isn't built for you know, much more than 45 minutes of, of football. Um, so were you surprised that none of those changes were made um, from the off in the, the second half? Yeah, it, it you know, you, we've seen it before where he's, where he has to do stuff like that. It seems like, um, you know, what would it have, would it have changed it? I mean, you, you tell me, Tom, you know, do you think that, that, it would have changed it immediately at the 45 minute point. What do you think? It's a hard one because I, th I know that Dagan disagrees with me on this. I would have, I would have put Pascal Gross on. Um, and the reason for that is because in theory, you're, you've, you're a man to the good um, and you want to start moving the ball around a lot quicker um, because you want to get them to chase. That's going to tire them out. You've got the man advantage. There's more space you know, logic and Pascal Gross is your silky passer of the ball. So it, for me, it would have been gross for either Lalana or, and I know, you know, Dagan and Glenn, you, you've already inclined that you disagree with this, which is absolutely fine. Perhaps Belaba. Um, I thought at times Belaba looked a bit, you know, a bit shaky in the first half. Um, and I just think when you've got that man advantage, do you really need the defensive midfielder on the pitch? But now I know Dagan's saying, but again, <laughs> in theory, when you've got a man to the good, there's more space. You want the silky passing of a Pascal Gross. So maybe Gross for Lalana or Gross for Belaba. Um, obviously, we saw what did happen. So I was I was surprised that at least one of them didn't start from the half. Um, but it's impossible to to predict what what no, would happen. It's it's not possible to predict, but it is possible to uh, predict that Dagan has something to say. He was just jamming his fist in his mouth because he had an opinion um, about that. Look at him. You can see him there. I, he's, um, he, I'm, I welcome Dagan to chase him, but before he does, I would just like to just say one more thing because I know what he's going to link this to because it's not just about Pascal, is it, Dagan? It's about who came on with Pascal Gross. And just before you talk about that, I'd just like to mention, I do think that, you know, if Hinchelwood had stayed on the pitch, maybe that would have been a bit different. But Dagan, I welcome you to, to share your thoughts. I would have been very fine with Pascal coming on for Lalana at the 10, at half. I too expected we might see that change. I thought the other alternative there would have been Jao Pedro to see, you know, could he cut through the lines? Um, and I thought it might, that might come down to who was the fitter of the two. Um, I was stunned to see four simultaneous changes. I mean, say, say what you want. Deserve is decisive, if nothing else. Um, I, as soon as I saw the duo coming in and who they were coming on for, for Gross and Milner, I said, we're going to concede on the counter. I said it to everybody in the room that I was in. We took off Baleba, who I hear you, Tom. I hear that he looks shaky. 
he brings something that no one else brings, which is the ability to run back and recover the ability to run fast and at least disrupt when things are going sideways, when we invariably, no matter how skilled Pascal Gross is, he's going to give the ball away three or four times a game in a terrible spot, often leading to a chance. So like all of the, like we've got Pascal Gross is, you know, hung the moon. I get it. Everyone loves Pascal Gross. He's an incredible footballer. He's an incredible talent, but he, he can't get back. He is not in the frame when we can see these counterattack goals. And so for everybody that's, you know, how do we concede so much? What is wrong with us? You can't, you can't have him out there all the time with a makeshift back line. And you certainly, for all that is holy, I, 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 I trust in Deserby, Glenn, to your point. I totally do. But I, I do not trust his judgment when it comes to the combination of Pascal Gross and James Miller, Milner as two defensive players. Because it, it took four minutes. It took four minutes for a total disaster that Milner, bless his heart. And and I, I think Milner made a great play. I don't think it was a pen. But he put us in the position where we could have given away the pen because we had those guys on the pitch when we didn't need to. Baleba was fine. Baleba was the player for this game because he was our insurance policy when we're pressing forward as we're going to do when we have 80% of the ball and a half. Right, we're gonna press forward and we're gonna expose ourselves to a team. Chelsea, if nothing else, has blazing speed, blazing speed out there. Right, like it just it boggled my mind that we opened ourselves up that way. I know we were chasing the game, but I mean, I think any reasonable person would have expected we're gonna get to at least even down two one with a half to play with. Um, and it certainly looked that way even early on. Like I didn't look at the early part of the first half and think there's no way we're scoring a goal here. Did you guys? I'll leave it there. Hmm. Get on to that point in just a second, Dagan, because I know, again, it's something that me and you disagree with. Uh, before, Joe, before we conceded a penalty, um, there were huge calls uh, by Brighton fans, and rightfully so, uh, for a second Chelsea player to receive a second yellow card. Um, and just really quickly, Joe, and I've just started this question, but I've just seen the chat about bringing players in from the championship and from Sunderland. There is one player from Sunderland I would absolutely love us to sign. He's a young lad from Stourbridge and he goes by the name of Job Bellingham. And I don't just say that because he's Jude Bellingham's younger brother. I say that because he's a bloody good player and it would warm my heart to have you, Job Bellingham at this club because he's only from down the road. But anyway... Um, I, I move. Uh, so, Joe um, Caicedo, how the hell did he not get a second yellow from hacking down Matoma? I think he put in about three or four challenges where, realistically, he should have been given a second yellow card. The ref bottled it. Are we, again, are we surprised? Why did he not get a second yellow? Look at the badge on his chest. How many tackles did he make that should have had a second yellow card after the one that we're talking about? The officials take away the opportunity for Brian of Albion to play Chelsea against nine men. That penalty never happens for a start if he's sent off, which he should have been sent off. And that's why I'm annoyed because all of these if buts and maybes you can say, oh, yeah, we didn't play well enough, this, that, and the other. But the officials aren't giving a fair decision. Therefore, infecting the integrity of the game and infecting the integrity of whatever the hell happens next, because it's not authentic. The referees are making stupid decisions that are leading to things that should not be happening. That's why I'm annoyed that it wasn't pulled back for, for a second yellow. Um and, you know, as I say, we can go on about that. We didn't finish our chances. We didn't create enough. The thing is, <laughs> we were robbed of the chance to see what would have happened. That's what really pisses me off about these officials. Yeah, it was a, it was a poor decision. Um, and the fact that Chelsea were already down to 10 men shouldn't have uh, come into it. Um, I think, yeah, it's uh, the refs bottled the, uh, the decision to send off a second Chelsea player at Stamford Bridge. Um, and it was just uh, really, really poor, really poor officiating. 
uh, to not do that, um, especially as uh, moments later, uh, the penalty is given away. Now, Joe, I'm going to come to you back on this one because, you know, me and you in the group chat, we were we were on the side of, yeah, it's a penalty. I know uh, that might not be with uh, the the majority of the thinking of Brighton fans, but for me, um, it's clumsy. Uh, Milner doesn't win the ball. He puts his arm out like that. He's not pushing Mudrick with force, but he's still putting his arm out like that. Um, so I can see why it's been given. What annoys me, Joe, is that the referee was in a good position, sees it, no penalty, it's his decision. VAR then have a lengthy check and send him over. Now, of course, mm. the whole point of a penalty decision is to overturn decisions where, um, you know, it's clear and obvious that the official on the pitch has made a mistake. If it's taking that long... Is it clear and obvious? And secondly, um, does the referee genuinely see a foul in that when he's sent over to the monitor? Or do you think that he's, um, you know, he, he because he's been sent over there, he, he feels like he has to do it? Because I, I, mm. I can only recall once a referee sticking with his on-field decision after going to the monitor once. I mean, I don't watch a huge amount of Premier League football, so it's possibly and probably happened more than that but i can only recall it happening once so what, what were your thoughts um on the penalty joe was it soft or was it clumsy or was it a mixture of both i think it's a mixture of both i think dan's just said in the chat you see them not given 90 percent of the time i would disagree with that i think you see them given 50 50 um, and we've spoken about consistency of the referee so much um and i think that that situation between Milner and Mudrich is a situation where the referees would normally give a penalty, in my opinion. Um, Milner's giving the officials a decision to make. That's the first mistake that Milner's making, is that he's getting his body in a really clumsy, awkward position that VAR could look at it from all different angles. And I said in the group chat, and I'll say as much here, if that happens to us, and there's a tangle of legs and, and an arm on one of our players, I'm screaming for a penalty. I don't care. It did happen I'm, to I'm... us. It did happen to us later in the game. It happened with Matoma. Yeah, and what well, did I say, Joe? What did I say in response? Well, the, the Matoma one, in fairness, he goes down easy. Like, very, 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 very easy. Um, and there wasn't that much of a tangle of bodies in the Matoma one, in my opinion. Whereas with the, the Milner one, there's multiple points of contact where you can say, yeah, that that gives enough for Mudrich to go over. That's just my opinion. Um, and yeah, you give the officials a, a decision to make, they'll make it. And I think it's one of those decisions that goes 50-50 either way every time. Um, and yeah, I, I at, at first I was screaming for the Matoma penalty, but then I see it back and I think, okay, maybe there's not enough contact there. Go on, Dave. Why doesn't the logic like last week apply? Because in this very logic podcast, in this very podcast about Nottingham Forest, we said if the Jal Pedro one that we received first is decided a penalty, then they have to give that second one to Forest, even though it also shouldn't have been a penalty. So why in this instance, when they're given a penalty erroneously by VAR after the fact, doesn't VAR then make the same kind of decision even if it's a bad one for us, when a player is hand on the shoulder from behind, pressure exerted, Milner's hand in front of the body, in front on the chest, not pulling from behind. If Milner had pulled Mudrick from behind, sure, obvious. His but did their feet did their feet not also get tangled after the ball was gone? Their feet did not get tangled until after the ball was gone. In my opinion, okay, and I think in the referee who is charged with refing the game's opinion. No, I, I, do think, I, I do think the referee should have stuck with his on-field decision. As you say, Joe, I, I do agree because I think I've seen them given for a, a lot less. So I can see why the referee's given it. I do think it was mm -hmm. soft, but I think there the referee has to be strong and say, nope, I'm sticking with my on-field decision because it's not mm -hmm. only, it's his integrity at the end of the day. So, but yeah, I, I, I can, I can see the frustration. Um, and it was a very frustrating 
uh, afternoon. Glenn, just um, really quickly, what were your thoughts on, on on this penalty decision? For you, was it a soft penalty? Was it clumsy from Milner? Where do you land on this uh, penalty decision? I think it was both. I think it was clumsy, but I also think it was soft. And I do wish, I wish that he would have, just like you said, Tom, I wish that when he went over to the monitor that he would have stood there and said, you know, look at it and, you know, but ultimately stick with his decision. He's the guy that's standing right there. He watched it happen. And it's almost like when you get dragged over to the monitor, it's like everybody's watching you go over there. Everybody's watching you and you know, there's thousands and thousands of eyes and everybody's expecting something. Everybody, especially when you're at Chelsea, it's Chelsea. It's almost like he's like, well, I, I guess I'm going to have to give it to him. You know, I guess, I guess. And so I, I think that I almost think that he probably walked over there knowing what was going to happen. That's, that's what I think. Um, I, I, I don't think that it should have been a penalty. Um, it was, it was, it was clumsy. And, it, and I, I love what Dagan said that we wouldn't even be having this discussion if Milner was not on the pitch. If he was, you know, sitting down, you know, enjoying himself, then we wouldn't have conversations like this. And, and Dagan knows how much I love Pascal Gross to just go back to what we were talking about. Um, Joe likes Pascal Gross too. Now, can I just cut in very quickly and show a still from the decision, which will back me up. I don't believe the ball is gone in this still image that I found. And you can clearly see a tangle of legs. So if that happens at the other end of the pitch, I'm screaming for a penalty. That doesn't happen and, for Matoma. And we're not freaking getting it, ever. No, but that but but that doesn't happen for Matoma. There's a hand on his back, which you can argue is there enough force for him to go down. That for me is unbelievably stupidly clumsy. Do you do you think the referee do you think the referee on the pitch went to that monitor and saw something that he didn't see in real time? No. No, he saw well, that in real time, and yeah. he decided it wasn't a penalty. Exactly. But then, but, but then VAR have seen <laughs> that. Which, if 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 the if the referee's not seeing that, is that not clear and obvious? It's not clear and obvious in real time. It's not clear and obvious. But he's missing a tangle of legs. Then there's no ref. Then you take the ref off the pitch and you put the ref in the VAR booth because there's no point in having a ref on the pitch. That's not clear and obvious, Joe. By any definition, that's not clear and obvious. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd be, I'm not I'd, mad at you. I'd, I'd, I'm mad at the application of these non-existent no, no, rules that are selected whenever the heck they feel like. It's so inconsistent. It's a joke. And like for us to be like, oh, no, look, it's it's kind of OK. It's not OK. It's a shambles. It's a shambles. Us and Wolves every other week. It is always up to the wolves, isn't no it? I do feel sorry for us. Things. Things. And it's Although, not a coincidence either that it's happening every game after Zerbi calls it out. It's a joke. Yeah, I, 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 I'm inclined to agree, Dagan. I do, th I do agree with you, Joe, because I think it was clumsy from James Milner. But I do think that the referee should have stuck with his on-field decision uh, because things in real time look different. And I, I that's what I think is the main thing here because everything on VAR is slowed down. It's slow man. Everything looks worse in slow motion. Um, and don't get me wrong, I know that we benefit from that um, the occasionally. Um, but for me, you know, I, 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 I feel frustrated um, by the officials, really, really frustrated. And not to raise Dagan's blood pressure anymore, um, but I feel too much is being made of the poor officiating. And it's almost forgiving us for our poor performance because our performance was poor. We didn't make the most of our man adv advantage. We played against 10 men for 45 minutes and we didn't show up until the 85th. You can't do that and expect to get anything from a game or feel hard done by. You didn't do enough. So I, I get I get the frustration at Caicedo not being sent off because he should have been. I get the frustration at the penalty. But Dagan, but that's not what happened. We still had to play on against 10 men, one player less than we had, and we didn't make the most of it. Tom, we, didn't, we just Tom, didn't. They had... They had 12. They had 12. With those decisions, it's 12. Okay. And I promise you, those those guys are worth every bit one player. And they were, because if they get the decision right, it's nine players. 
So no, like I, I don't disagree with that, Dagan. But what but what do you want us to do in terms of chances? What what more do you want guys to do than what we did today? Well, Adingra made some very poor decisions. Let, let's let's start with uh, Simon Adingra. All right, give me yeah, that's what I want to hear. I want to hear your specifics yeah. of where we're. So, so Simon Adingra often uh, made some pretty poor decisions in the final third. There was a moment where Evan Ferguson tried a cheeky back heel instead of leaving it for Pedro to have a tap in. So there were opportunities where Brighton could have done better. And I think we can all sit here and bemoan officials, and rightfully so, bemoan VAR, rightfully so. But we we can't shirk every bit of responsibility on the game. You have to play the game to the whistle. You can't sit here and think, oh, we're hard done by, and let's create a hypothetical situation where X, Y, and Z happened. We that This was the game. We didn't play well enough. We didn't create enough opportunities. We didn't test Sanchez enough until the late eighty minutes ish, and obviously we got our, and we got our due we got our due, due diligence there because we got a corner and João Pedro scored from it. It was excellent. And but where was that desire? Where was that directness? Where was that uh, intent from forty five oh one to eighty? 20 minutes where it was quite lackluster quite and I get I get what you say Dagan because I do agree Caicedo breaking up play but he shouldn't have been on the pitch and I I do I am frustrated by it of course I am but I do feel like we shouldn't just sit here and just moan about the officials we also have to take some responsibility and say well actually we we didn't play all that well in the first half we didn't make the most of our man advantage in the second half. And Billy Gilmore said as much in his post-match comments. So I do think that there is responsibility to go around here. Um, so that's just my opinion. And what I will say as well, we're talking about the referee. Let's talk about the <laughs> absolute shambles that happened uh, in, the, in the, the dying embers of the game when uh, it looked... Like Brighton were going to be given a penalty uh, for a handball that wasn't a handball. That was the correct decision. Um, and the ref blue pointed at the spot, gave a penalty. Um, but VAR overturned this um, by saying it hit Colwell's face, which it did. So it was the correct decision. However, there was a lot of controversy um, because the ball hit Colwell, then went behind for a corner. Um, but then the referee... Uh, decided to give a drop ball. Um, and I was absolutely fuming at the time because, you know, Brighton had been denied a corner um, after just having scored a corner. Um, they were denied that corner. Um, and it 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 says, um, I, I found out on Twitter, I'll just read you what it said. Um, so because the decision was reverse, it's a drop ball by the letter of the law. Um, that's the correct application of the rules. Now, that is very frustrating because I didn't know that rule existed. Um, and I think this is where, Joe, we see another call for the referees to be miked and for us to hear what they're saying, because then we would be able to hear the referee saying, no, because I've, I've overturned the decision. These are the rules of the game. But everyone sort of stood there going, well, what's going on? The pundits didn't have a clue. I didn't have a clue. I bet you guys didn't have a clue either. Um, I, the players didn't look like they seemed to know what was going on. Um, so is this, if nothing else, a learning opportunity uh, that probably won't be taken, um, but for referees and officials to be mic'd up and for us to hear what they are saying? Absolutely. Everything, every stupid decision that we've seen this weekend in the Premier League is a learning opportunity for these officials, this PGO, MOL, whatever they're called, to take a hard look at themselves this week in the mirror and think, what changes do we need to make? But they will not make those changes. No matter how much we talk about it, no matter how much the pundits talk about it, no matter how much the managers talk about it, no matter how much the players talk about it. So basically, no matter how much anybody talks about it that is involved in the game of football, whether it suits them or not, they won't change it at all. Um and, you know, I don't know if you watched the, the Man City game, um, but there was a chance at the end of that game where Harlem plays in Jack Grealish and the referee plays advantage. Harlem plays the ball and then blows the whistle as soon as Jack Grealish is through on goal. 
So I wonder what the hell we would have heard on the referee's microphone when Harlan runs up to him and screams in his face. Wasn't given a red card, by the way. So Yeah, uh, yeah but come on, man. You... Dunk was given a red card for foul and abusive language. We yeah, don't... but so... Yeah, but we don't lip know read, what Harlan said. We we lip, we vaguely lip read what Dunk said. Lip, lip read Harland at the end. He says fuck off. Yeah. Is that not foul and abusive language? Well, that's not the same as calling someone a bald prick, is it? Still foul and abusive language, disrespect towards the referee. But that's not the point anyway. The point is we would benefit to hear what the referees are saying, but it will never happen. So what's the point in the conversation? <laughs> Because that's how we get changed. <laughs> Remember, Joe, be more mosquito. It's true. It's true. Shout out to you, Mark. Yeah, it's. It, I think we can all sit here and we can all agree that it was a monumentally uh, frustrating afternoon or morning uh, for our American uh, friends here. Um, I think Brighton can feel very hard done by um, for what we saw today. Roberto De Zerbi's post-match comments um, um, said said as much, and I think you know it's just a, a really frustrating game. And Chelsea, you could argue, probably they didn't deserve to win because I don't think they particularly offered much themselves. Um, so yeah, I, and that's just the sort of it's just a really frustrating game, just monumentally frustrating. And once again, we're sat here instead of talking about the quality of football or the quality of tactics and how we can have you know a tactical battle between two fine managers. We're sat here. Talking about the referees and the officials for what feels like the umpteenth time this season. Welcome back to PGMOL Obsessed. That's what it feels like. It's just getting to. It's just. It's just referee obsessed. VAR obsessed because it's just. It's just every week, every single week. Um. So yeah, it's um really hard one to take. Really, really hard one to take. So, there you have it. To your question, Tom, about why the Premier League has access to every kind of technology available to man. Whatever choices they make about what's not available is a choice they're making. That decision today at the end of the Man City game keeps a title race between Arsenal, Liverpool, City, Spurs, all ongoing. Man U, Newcastle, just out of the picture. Aston Villa, a little, little in, in the mix with those two teams. We're a little further back. Chelsea inched ever closer. Right? I mean, like, having, having as many of the big six teams in the title race going towards the end of the season is an ideal win-win for this league. Any decision that furthers that agenda, to me, is reason to be suspect. There, there's no, like once the referee let play go on and then stopped it, like what? And I'm talking about the city decision. If anybody saw it, like it, it was mind boggling that the whistle blew at that point because he he said no no play on and then said oh wait wait wait, wait no that that looks like more of an opportunity than I thought it was going to be let's stop. Like if I'm a city fan, I'm if I'm livid. Um, yeah, but again, no, it's it's just coincidence, and it all evens out, and there's no there's no agenda, and it's all just happenstance because everything in the world is. Uh, none of these decisions are motivated by money or viewers or eyeballs. That no, none such thing exists in the Premier League. It's a sacred, holy place of English football, tried and true, no question marks at all. It's the best league in the world, Dagan. The best. Sorry. Yeah. Why? To Dan's point, automated offside tech would be. So easy. It's there. Yeah. It's right there for the taking. Mic'd yeah. up referees. It's there in rugby. It's there for the taking. We could have heard what happened. And oh my gosh, you're right. I didn't see that contact there on that. That's obviously a penalty. I, that is an error. It'd be great to hear that, in fact. Other not just like, well, I don't want to make my VAR buddy look bad for calling me over here. Uh, can, I ask, can I ask a question? So do we have to have English referees? Only. Why can't we have do we? Oh. I roughly. think the FA generally um, they will always hire internally, um, and I do think it's part of their um, 
you know, they want to get ref more referees into the game from grassroots level, bring them up through the system and whatnot. Um, I'm pretty sure in the Premier League, in fact, through most of the, you know, the the football league, yeah, I think the majority of, if not all of, the referees and and officials are English or British. Um, answers on a postcard, if you know that one. Um, I've just always assumed that that they are British, but I know obviously when we go to tournaments and stuff, and be they European or global, very few British referees make the cut. Um, but you know we've seen some pretty appalling referees in Europe this season as well. So <laughs> let's give our European friends their their fair their fair due there as well. It just seems that you know you've got all this technology in place to make the referees' lives easier. Um, and yeah, we're just not striking that right balance at the moment. Um, so yeah, very, very frustrating. I think death. it's really concerning. I'm really concerned about our game and about the way that we've been talking about it this season. There's been so many conversations that I've had with so many people saying about whether they want to watch the Premier League anymore, whether they want to watch Brighton anymore because we're in the Premier League, where how they're falling out of love with the game because there aren't these moments where you know, instant moments of pure joy ripped away from you. I miss those days. I really do. Or those days where something will go for you, something will go against you, but that's just football. Do you know what I mean? That that they, Those were the phrases we used to have. That's just football. It goes your way sometimes. Glenn, you said it perfectly on the fan zone. The ball bounces the way it bounces what where is that it's not there anymore because every single bounce every single blade of grass every single movement in our game is looked at under the tight like the, the most powerful microscope in the world to take away something and i just think it's really concerning i i yeah i am inclined to agree but i'm still a big advocate of var or what it could be because uh, as someone who has grown up watching rugby you see how it can be done you can see what it can do and then you get the, the inf- because the, the problem we've got is var is making the wrong calls or they're backing up their friends instead of making the right calls that's the issue here the issue isn't the necessary the system although the system can be improved with semi-automated offside and things like that it's the people behind the system that's the problem um, yeah, that's, I don't it's, know. It's, it's it's not me sitting here saying screw VAR, get rid of VAR. It's me sitting here saying we're waiting eight minutes in the stadium at times to wait for the correct decision. And yes, Tom, I, I fully, I yeah. exactly, I fully agree. It's down to the people that are running it. But you know what? If they can't use this bloody system right, take it away from them. Treat them like a three-year-old. If they're not using that toy properly or not playing correctly, take it away from them. Remove remove the situation and just go back to how we used to do it. Oh, do, maybe do that's really old-fashioned of me, but I don't know. No, not like, necessarily, but I just I just think I don't. The problem will remain because you will still have the same officials making bad calls, and I think that's yeah. the problem. The problem is the people, and I think. The VAR perhaps not only magnifies what you're saying, Joe, but also magnifies their ineptitude. Um, so it, it just needs to be different. And I think the whole of refereeing in this country needs to be different. And I'm not the man to deliver that difference. Um, but but you I, could be, again, be my I mosquito. Be. That's not my road. That's not my journey. Um, yeah, I, I feel like we could sit here and bemoan VAR um for the rest of the night and um i'm sure it won't be uh, the last time we talk about the officials and var this season i imagine we'll probably be talking about them on wednesday um because we start a string of three home games on wednesday two of which are against premier league opposition and one against marseille so dagan brentford are next now i think you know we've all said before a ball was kicked today a point a win would have been absolutely amazing given our injuries um, because it's an away game. Um, some some massive games coming up at home now. Uh, we didn't make the most of our home games against the likes of Fulham and against Sheffield United. How imperative is it for you that we put things right against Brentford on Wednesday? I mean, it, it's, it's a huge game. It's a huge, huge game. It's a rivalry game for Tony Bloom. Uh, 
they're sitting, what, three points behind us? Uh, in 11th, but three points behind us, which tells you how close we are to falling out of the top 10. Um, Chelsea has an absolutely cake schedule in December. Um, they're at Man U, and then they go on a run of, I think, like six very winnable games. Like, I think it's away Everton. They've got Sheffield home. Um, you know, we've we've got not a terrible December, I think, coming up. Um, but this one feels massive. The Burnley one following it feels equally massive, both at home. Um, Steven in the chat says minimum of four points. And, yeah, that even that feels like not enough with two home games. I mean, it really feels like we – to to be it to be it in a good spot, trying to stay in Europe, by a means other than winning the Europa League, uh, it feels like we need these six points desperately. Um, and again, I know it's a long season; we're not healthy, and I'm I I keep coming back to that, right? I mean, I, I don't I want to get, I know we're I know we're moving on to Brentford, but I sent in the chat before the game today, the list of the possible team that we could have put out there. Um, Right, we got Welbeck, we had Pedro, who could have been at the nine, uh, sort of banged up and not starting. We had uh, Matoma, Ailing, who did come on later. We have uh, Ansu Fati and CISO out, Sally March out. Uh, behind them, we have Dehoud on suspension. Gross was battered and not able to start. Uh, in the back, we have Stupignan. We have Dunk on a suspension. We have Webster out hurt. We have Lamptey out hurt. Uh, that's a that's a whole eleven plus two or whole ten plus two outfield players. It it's hard for our expectations to be yeah, but we gotta win, right? Like, you know, I look at I look at our performance today against Chelsea's performance, and sure they had some guys out too, but again, the caliber of players that they that they are putting out there are are high level players. Um, you know, when you look at their midfield too and our midfield too. It, even if you think Baleba could be as good as Caicedo, he's not today. Um, and as good as Billy Gilmore is, I don't, I don't think anyone would argue that he's better than Enzo right now. Um, so if you look at that duo and Connor Gallagher, for all of his rashness, he is, you know, pacey and attacking in a way that Lalana is not um, right. When you start going on the pitch and you look at their performance and our performance, I don't feel like we were outperformed today. Um, and that I think that's what gets me. Like I'm I'm reflecting on like why am I so upset? I you know, were we not good enough? Sure, we weren't good enough, but we probably weren't good enough when we showed up. But I feel like we played well enough to at least have a draw from this game. And again, officiating decisions, I feel like were the difference between us at a minimum having a draw. I think if we go two man up in the fifty fourth, fifty-fifth minute with Caicedo leaving, I think we win that game going away. I don't think we just get one more goal and I don't think we can see the one that they had. Um, so we just need one more after that uh, to win, to win the game. Um, and again, right. Uh, ifs, buts, and maybes uh, feels like a real summary, especially of the last month for sure. Uh, the games are huge. Marseille is huge, right? I mean, the next three games could decide a ton. If I, if I had to trade dropping one of the first two to win the last one, I would, I'd rather, I'd rather beat Marseille than, than win these these next two, um, you know, as big as they seem, that one seems bigger. <sighs> yeah, yeah, I'm all right in thinking if that we if we beat Marseille, we finish the group, and then we don't have to play two more European games. Correct, correct. Yeah. We yeah. win the group. Yeah, we we get a yeah. bye to the round. Of and six. those those games are in March as well. Yep. Oh yeah. So the, I, the, I, the game the games we miss are in February. The games that we would play are in March. Sorry, that's correct. Yeah, I would I would happily sacrifice a win against Brentford or Burnley, or if not both, yeah. to, to beat Marseille. And then that's if, I had, if I had to pick, I'd say beat Brentford, lose to Burnley, uh, beat Marseille. If I had to pick one, I one don't want to take, and I don't want to sit in the Amex and watch another bloody loss to Burnley. Yeah, but it hurts us less in the standings. Like Brentford getting three and us dropping three. That's hurts fair. Us. That's fair. It's all about the math for me, man. You know that. My I, the sentiment is lost on me. Like, yeah, we lose to a bad team. I'm like, they're they're bad. It, it's it's a three point loss, not a six point loss. That's how I feel about it. Anyway, That's fair. I know, I know. Glenn, how do you how do you view the game on Wednesday? Is it for you what many would call a must win, or is it more of a must not lose? 
Um, I would say, I mean, it's it's not it's not a must win. Just like Dagan just said, it's not a must win. Um, and of the two, I would rather uh, lose to Burnley. And I understand, Joe, that you would be sitting there um, crying in your seat because of that. And I and I completely get it. I do. Uh, but I cannot stand Brentford. I cannot stand them. I don't know why I don't like them. I just don't. And uh, I don't know if it's um, the manager, if it's the owner, you know, the whole thing that he has going on with uh, Tony Bloom. Um, I, I would I would love to have us uh, beat them. And, and you know, and, and so so if we won Brentford and, and we lost at Burnley and then we went out and um, – smoked Marseille, that would be awesome. Or, you know, gritty, you know, dig it out, 99th minute, you know, goal to, to you know, get us to the top of the group, that would be awesome too. But I, I really, really, I think we can beat Brentford and um, it'll it'll depend on who they, you know, who he puts on the pitch. I, I hope Verbruggen is in goal. That's one thing that I would like to see. Yep. Yeah. It's um, it's like what Aaron always says. Ask me, ask me, at three o'clock on a on a Saturday. Of course, this is going to be a Wednesday, but yeah, um, it's who knows who's going to take to the pitch on Wednesday. Who knows who will have left uh, by then? Because there's still plenty of training to be done. So there's still plenty of injuries to have. Um, at least we'll have Duncan Dehoud back for Burnley. So there you go. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Joe, Dagan, and Glenn for 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 joining me this evening. Um, thank you, listeners and viewers, for joining us on this live stream. Or if you're watching this back after the fact, thank you for joining us. Don't forget to leave your comments in the section down below. Let us know your thoughts on the frustrating game. What did you think about the goals we conceded? When will Brighton keep a clean sheet in the Premier League? Or like Dagan says, does it simply not matter? Do we just need to keep scoring more than our opposition? What did you make of the officiating? What did you make of the penalty? And what did you make? of Galadog and Caicedo being, well, the latter of which should have been given a red, but uh, was not. So there you go. Thank you. Right. Um, one more thing before we go, everyone. Don't forget to check out One Clop Shop for 10% of all of your vintage football shirt requirements. If you drop in the code Albion Obsessed, all one word, all capital letters, you can get 10% off your next purchase. So that's it from me. Wherever you may be, whenever you may be, we will see you very shortly. Take care.